the Dhammapada. Chapter 16 Piyavagga Affection Verse 209 Avoid that which should be shunned. Ayoge yunjang attana yogas mincha ayojayam athanghitva piyagahi pihetattanu yoginam Applying oneself to that which should be avoided, not applying oneself to that which should be pursued, and giving up the quest, one who goes after pleasure envies those who exert themselves. Verse 210 Give up both what is dear and not dear. Ma piehi samaganchi, appiehi kudachanang, pianang adassanang dukkang, appianancha dassanang. Consort not with those that are dear, never with those that are not dear. Not seeing those that are dear and seeing those that are not dear are both. Painful. Verse 211. Hold nothing dear. Tasma piyangna kairatha piyapayo hi papako gantate sangna vijanti ye sangna thi piyapiyang. Hence, hold nothing dear. For separation from those that are dear is painful. Bonds do not exist for those to whom nothing is dear or not dear. Attachment hinders spiritual development. Once in Savati, the only son of a family became a bhikkhu without his parents' approval. Because of their strong attachment to their son, the father and mother also became a bhikkhu and a bhikkhuni. They could not live separated from one another and could not give up their affection. The family stayed in the monastery as if they were in their own house, talking and eating together, thus making themselves a nuisance to others. Other bhikkhus reported their behavior to the Buddha who admonished them. Once you have joined the order, you should no longer stay together like a family. There is no doubt that not seeing those who are dear and seeing those that are not dear to one are both painful. Even so, you should not hold any being or anything dear to you, because emotional attachment hinders spiritual development. Verse 212 Grief springs from endearment. Piyato jayati soko, piyato jayati bhayam, piyato vipamuttasa nathi soko kuto bhayam. From endearment springs grief, from endearment springs fear. For him who is wholly free from endearment, there is no grief, much less fear. The Buddha comforts the afflicted. Once, a rich householder was very depressed over the death of his son. He used to go to the cemetery and weep there. Early one morning, when the Buddha saw this householder in his vision, he went to see him and asked why he was feeling so sad. Then the man related the death of his son and about the pain and sorrow he was suffering from. The Buddha consoled him. Death does not occur only in one place. All beings that are born must die one day. Indeed, life ends in death. You must ever be mindful of the fact that life ends in death. Do not think that only your beloved son was subject to death. 
Do not be so distressed or be so shaken. Sorrow and fear arise out of endearment. Perceiving the fleeting nature of life, the rich householder attained the first stage of sainthood. Verse 213 Grief springs from affection. Pemato jayati soko, Pemato jayati bhayang. Pemato vipamuttasa nathiso ko kuto bhayam. From affection springs grief. From affection springs fear. For him who is wholly free from affection, there is no grief, much less fear. The Buddha comforts Visaka. One day, a granddaughter of Visaka named Sudatta died, and she felt very deeply grieved by her loss. So she went to the Buddha and expressed her grief. Then the Buddha said, Visaka, don't you realize that many people die in Savati every day? If you were to regard all of them as your grandchildren, you would have to be endlessly weeping and mourning. Let not the death of one child affect you too much. Sorrow and fear arise out of affection. Verse 214 Grief springs from attachment. Ratiya jayati soko Ratiya jayati bhayam, Ratiya vipamuttasa, Natiso ko kuto bhayam. From attachment springs grief, from attachment springs fear. For him who is wholly free from attachment, there is no grief, much less fear. The princes who fought over a courtesan. On one festival day, the Buddha entered the town of Vesali, accompanied by a group of bhikkhus. On their way, they met some Lichavi princes, who were elegantly dressed. The Buddha, seeing them in full regalia, said, Bhikkhus, those who have not been to the Tavatin Sadeva world should have a good look at these Lichavi princes. On their way to a pleasure garden, the princes met a beautiful courtesan and invited her to join them. There they quarreled over her and soon came to blows. As a result, some of them had to be carried home bleeding. On their way back after the alms round, the Buddha and the bhikkhus saw the wounded princes being carried home. The bhikkhus remarked, For the sake of a woman, these Lichavi princes are ruined. The Buddha then replied, Bhikkhus, sorrow and fear arise out of enjoyment of sensual pleasures and attachments. Verse 215 Grief springs from lust. Kamato jayati soko. Kamato jayati bhayam, Kamato vipamuttasa nathiso ko kuto bhayam. From lust springs grief, from lust springs fear. For him who is wholly free from lust, there is no grief, much less fear. Anithi Gandha Kumara loses his bride. Anithi Gandha Kumara lived in Savati. He was to marry a beautiful young girl from the city of Sagala. As the bride was coming from her home to Savati, she became ill and died on the way. When the bridegroom learned of the tragic death of his bride, he was overwhelmed with grief and pain. At this juncture, the Buddha went to his house knowing that the time was ripe for the young man to realize the Dhamma. The parents of the young man offered alms food to the Buddha. 
After the meal, the Buddha sent for the young man and asked him why he was in such pain and distress. He related the whole story of the tragic death of his young bride. Then the enlightened one said to him, Lust begets sorrow. It is due to lust for things and lust for sensual pleasures that sorrow and fear arise. On reflecting upon the advice of the Buddha, he overcame his grief and pain and realized the fleeting nature of sensual desires. Soon after, Anithi Gandha Kumara attained the first stage of sainthood. Verse 216 Grief springs from craving. Tanhaya jayati soko, Tanhaya jayati bhayam, Tanhaya vipamuttas nati soko kuto bhayam. From craving springs grief, from craving springs fear. For him who is wholly free from craving, there is no grief, much less fear. From craving springs sorrow. A Brahmin lived in Savati, and he was a follower of another religion. But the Buddha knew that the Brahmin would attain the first stage of sainthood in the near future. So the enlightened one went to the place where the Brahmin was plowing his field and talked to him. The Brahmin became friendly and was thankful to the Buddha for taking an interest in him and his work in the field. So he said, When I have harvested my rice from the field, I will first offer you some before I take it. I will not eat my rice until I have given you some. However, the Buddha knew beforehand that the Brahmin would not have the opportunity to harvest the rice from his field that year but he kept silent. One day, before the Brahmin could harvest his rice, there was a heavy downpour of rain, and his entire crop of rice was destroyed. The Brahmin was very sad, because he would no longer be able to offer any rice to his friend, the Buddha. The Buddha visited the Brahmin to console him, and the Brahmin related the great disaster that had befallen him. The Buddha advised him, Brahmin, sorrow and fear will never arise if there is no craving. A note from the author. There are three kinds of craving, or tanha in Pali. First, kama tanha is the common form of craving, which is simple attachment to all sensual pleasures. Second, bhava tanha is the attachment to existence or realm of form. Third, vibhavatanha is attachment to non-existence or to formless realms. According to the commentaries, bhavanatanha and vibhavatanha are attachment to sensual pleasures connected with the belief of eternalism. This craving is a powerful mental force latent in all and is the chief cause of most of the ills in life. It is this craving, gross or subtle, that leads to repeated births in sansara, and that which makes one cling to all forms of life. Verse 217 The virtuous are dear to all. Sīla dasana sampannaṁ dhamma Tang Sacha Vedinang Attano Kamma Kubbanang Tang Jano Kurute Piyang He who is perfect in virtue and insight is established in the Dhamma, has realized the truth and fulfills his own duties, is loved by all men. Kasapa receives baskets of cakes. On one festival day, the Buddha entered the city of Rajagha for alms food, accompanied by a group of bhikkhus. On their way, they met some boys going to a garden. 
The boys were carrying some baskets of cakes. They paid homage to the Buddha, but did not offer their cakes. The Buddha said to the bhikkhus, Although these boys did not offer any of the cakes, yet a bhikkhu who will receive the cakes is coming close behind us. We will proceed only after these boys have made their offering. After saying this, the Buddha and his bhikkhus rested under the shade of a tree. Just at that moment, Venerable Mahakasapa came along. The boys took a liking to him immediately, paid homage and offered the cakes to him. Venerable Mahakasapa then advised the boys, My teacher, the exalted one, is resting beneath a tree over there, accompanied by some bhikkhus. Go and make an offering of your cakes to him. The boys did as they were told. The Buddha accepted their offering. Later, some bhikkhus remarked that the boys were showing favoritism to Venerable Mahakasapa. The Buddha then explained, Bhikkhus, all bhikkhus who are like my son, Kasapa, are liked by both devas and men. Such bhikkhus always receive the four requisites of bhikkhus. Verse 218 the non-attached go upstream. Chanda jato anakate manasacha putosiya kamesucha appati padhachito udham sototi vuchati. He who has developed a wish for the ineffable nibbana. He whose mind realizes it with the three fruits. He whose mind is not bound by material pleasures. Such a person is called an upstream bound one. The elderly monk who was reborn in the pure abode. On one occasion, the pupil of an elderly monk asked him whether he had attained arahanthood. But he did not say anything, although he had actually attained the third stage of sainthood. He kept silent, because he had resolved not to talk about his attainment until he had attained arahanthood. But he passed away without attaining arahanthood, and also without saying anything about his attainment. His pupils thought that their teacher had passed away without attaining sainthood, and they felt sorry for him. They asked the Buddha where their teacher was reborn. He replied, Bhikkhus, your teacher, who was an anagami before he passed away, is now reborn in the abodes of the Brahmas, in the Suddhavasa Brahmaloka, he did not reveal his attainment because he felt ashamed that he had achieved only that much. He was ardently striving to attain arahanthood. Your teacher is now freed from attachment to the sensual world, the Kama Loka. A note from the author. The Suddhavasas or pure abodes are a group of five heavens. They are the exclusive planes of anagamis or never-returners, those who have attained the third stage of sainthood. Ordinary beings are not born in these states. Those who have attained anagami in other planes are reborn in these pure abodes. Later, they attain arahanthood and reside in those planes until that life term ends. The names of the inhabitants of these pure abodes are Aviha, Atapa, Sudasa, Sudasi, and Akanita. Verses 219 and 220. Merit welcomes the doers of good. Chirappa va sing purisang. Durato soting agatang, 
nyati mitta suhajja cha abhinandanti sagatam tatheva kata punyampi asma loka parangatam punyani patiganhanti piyang nyating va agatam a man long absent and returned safe from afar, his kinsmen, friends, and well-wishers welcome on his arrival. Likewise, his good deeds will receive the well-doer who has gone from this world to the next, as kinsmen will receive a dear one on his return. Nandiya attains heavenly glory. Nandiya was a rich man from Benares, modern-day Varanasi. After listening to the Buddha's discourses on the benefits of building monasteries for bhikkhus, Nandiya built the Mahavihara monastery at Isipatana. The building was pinnacled and fully furnished. As soon as the monastery was offered to the Buddha, a mansion came up for Nandiya in the Tavatimsa Deva world. One day, when Venerable Mahamogallana visited the Tavatimsa Deva world, he saw the mansion which was meant for the donor of the Mahavihara monastery at Isipatana. On his return from the Tavatimsa Deva world, Venerable Mahamogallana asked the Buddha, Venerable Sir, are those who perform meritorious deeds able to receive the fruits of mansions and other riches in the Deva world, even while they are still living in this world? The Buddha replied, Why do you ask this question? You yourself have seen the beautiful palace and riches waiting for Nandiya in the Tavatinsa Deva world. The Devas await the coming of the good and generous ones as relatives await the return of one who is long absent. When the good ones die, they are welcomed joyously to the abode of the devas. <laughs>